James Rohack, who's the president of the AMA, uh, in order to obtain the AMA's support for his health reform proposal. So this was part of the quid pro quo for that support. Uh, and that was to, uh, uh, to explore ways of, if you will, taking the malpractice bear off of the back of doctors. And so uh, uh, what the uh, Health Reform Act uh, uh, authorized uh, was uh, a series of uh, two kinds of projects, pilot projects and demonstration projects, to explore several ideas, um, one of which was uh, this uh, idea of malpractice guidelines as safe harbors. And so the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which is uh, a research unit, if you will, or a funding re research funding unit within uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, um, called for proposals uh, and uh, ended up um, uh, uh, approving, um, granting uh, 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 a, uh, an application by the state of Oregon to uh, fund uh, a, a uh, two hundred or three hundred thousand dollar project to explore. Uh, uh, crafting broadly supported safe harbor legislative proposal that will define the legal standard of care and then to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of this plan. Um, so to understand, uh, uh, and I, uh, to understand where this is coming from, um, from the standpoint at least of the medical profession, you have to look at it in an historical context. Um, the profession, as I mentioned earlier, um, has struggled um, uh, since the beginning of the Republic, actually since before the beginning of the Republic, to assert control over the legal standard of care to which physicians are held. And this is a sort of two, they've waged this battle on two fronts, an internal battle to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 consolidate agreement over what the appropriate medical approach is, which is an internal struggle which, uh, in which the regulars, the, the folks we now regard as mainstream medical practitioners, fought against rival schools of thought, the osteopaths, the chiropractors, homeopaths, naturopaths, during the 19th century, uh, for pre supremacy, and uh, uh, and by the um, and by the end of the uh, uh, 19th century, uh, the uh, the regulars, as they were called, the mainstream physicians, essentially uh, gained uh, control. How did they do that? Well, they started out. It started out with licensure. Okay, so um, e uh, bef uh, even in the late um, 1800s, uh, sorry, 1700s, um, states um, uh, led actually by New York City began to pass laws that required physicians to have a license to practice medicine. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, no the number of these laws uh, increased during the early 19th century, but then two things happened. One was that Andrew Jackson was elected president uh, on a populist democratic uh, platform that was uh, 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 blatantly anti elite and in particular against the elites on the East and West Coast, and on the East Coast, uh, this may sound uh, eerily familiar to you, um, and uh, in the context of today's um, campaigns, uh, and uh, the East Coast intellectuals were primarily lawyers and physicians, and so this was a, this was a kind of reaction by the populace against the privileges uh, that were being uh, uh, asserted by the, by the uh, professions, in particular the, the legal and medical professions. Also, there was a fellow named Samuel Thomas. Thompson, uh, who was a um, uh, who was a um, uh, an entrepreneur um, and who uh, uh, who basically franchised an approach to medicine which uh, which uh, was based on the idea that everybody can treat themselves, uh, but of course you had to pay him a franchise fee in order to find out how to do this. And so these twin movements against the sort of privileged status of the professions led to the uh, uh, the uh, halt in the increase in licensure laws, and in fact the repeal of the, these laws, so that by 1840 no state had a medical licensure law. So it was a free for all, and that's what really opened the doors to these the proliferation of schools of thought uh, in medicine. Um, the American Medical Association was founded in 1847, and it it was uh, um, uh, it was in part in response to a, a kind of um, development from the the, uh, the, re, the the elimination of the licensure laws, and that was the proliferation of malpractice suits. Beginning of the 19th century, there were virtually no malpractice suits against physicians, although the common law recognized such suits, you know, going back actually to 13, uh, 13 and 1400s. But there were essentially no suits in the United States until around 1840, and historians generally link this to the reaction of the public, or in part to the reaction of the public, to the fact that 
anybody could practice medicine, and many of them were doing it in rather frightening ways, uh, 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 injurious ways. Uh, and so there began to be uh, an enormous uh, uh, burst in uh, malpractice suits, and the formation of the, Medi of the American Medical Association was one of the, profession the medical profession's reactions uh, to that. Um, the, the AMA uh, uh, fought on a number of fronts um, to consolidate control over the standard of care internally uh, against the so-called irregulars, the osteopaths and homeopaths and so on. And one of the things they pushed for was the reinstitution of licensure laws. And so by the end of the 19th century, all states had, had adopted some form of a licensure requirement again. Um, and in addition, uh, they fought a battle, particularly at the very turn of the 20th century, to consolidate control over medical education. One of the uh, characteristics of medical education in the 19th century was that it was uh, an entrepreneurial free-for-all, uh, much like the practice itself. Anybody could open a medical school, anybody could grant a diploma, and um, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, essentially, uh, and, and to the extent that you needed a diploma or to get a license, this basically let anybody uh, who could get into one of these uh, a large number of medical schools to get a license. So the AMA, as you, uh, you may have heard of the Flexner Report, which was a, a, a program that the AMA sponsored uh, with the Carnegie Foundation in the early 20th century, first decade of the 20th century, in which the AMA studied the, uh, the uh, uh, problems created by this sort of uh, lax uh, uh, system of medical education, and uh, basically asserted control over medical education in order to get uh, uh, to be to get a license, you had to be uh, graduate from an approved medical school, and the AMA had a committee, a council on medical education, that was the approving body. One of the consequences of this was that the number of medical schools dropped significantly um, until there were very very few uh, uh, by the uh, second decade of the 20th century. So these twin efforts, licensure and consolidation of control over medical uh, education, essentially cemented the profession's control over the standard of care insofar as it was the, uh, it was the mainstream medical approach, what we now call modern, the modern scientific approach to medicine, which uh, uh, emerged triumphant. Um, there was also uh, um, a, a battle. Um, uh, there was also a battle over the um, external control of the standard of care, with the medical profession during the 19th century seeking to assert its control over the legal standard that would be applied to medical professionals. Uh, and uh, so that you have um, you have a um, the, this proliferation of. Can you all see the the. Yeah. So uh, you have this proliferation of malpractice suits um, starting in the mid uh, 19th century, uh, and uh, uh, and so uh, uh, this was uh, essentially a, a an attack, a, a an inroad into the sort of autonomy of the medical profession by external forces, in particular the legal system, in particular the judicial system, uh, as represented by the uh, by the tort uh, by tort actions. Um, and uh, there were a number of reasons for this proliferation of, of malpractice suits. I mentioned the sort, the, the, um, the, the uh, sort of reaction to the free-for-all that resulted from the Jacksonians and the Thomsonians. Um, there was also a, 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 a disenchantment with the, the mainstream medical practices of the time, which were primarily uh, consisted of three approaches, bleeding, purging, and blistering. Um, and this is bleeding. Um, bleeding uh, 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 has a little bit of a, of a beneficial effect, it turns out, but it was way overused during the 19th century. Blistering um, had essentially no beneficial effect, uh, caused great pain and suffering, and purging just made patients uh, very weak, uh, which allowed them to succumb to their illnesses. Uh, so uh, there was a reaction against that, and also the medical profession itself was stimulating malpractice suits because physicians were bringing malpractice or, or encouraging patients to, to sue other doctors who were competitors. And in addition, the regulars were using malpractice suits against the irregulars. And so the AMA uh, went, uh, 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 asserted its control over, uh, over its own members by, for example, getting the local medical societies, uh, the AMA is essentially a federation of local and state medical societies, to uh, prohibit their members from testifying as experts against other members. Um, they, also, um, uh, they also went after plaintiffs' experts in particular, uh, something that they've uh, also begun doing again 
uh, in the last uh, 15 or 20 years, uh, 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 particularly in Ohio, very strong efforts by the Ohio State Medical Association. Um, they also uh, actually began defending suits on behalf of their members, something that they do in Britain, and this is why uh, it's said that there are very few malpractice suits uh, against physicians in Britain, because they're all defended by the British Medical Association. Well, the AMA did that at the turn of the 20th century as well, and I'm sorry, the local medical societies did, and also uh, they provided uh, their members with cheap medical insurance, uh, sorry, uh, cheap malpractice insurance. Um, which actually cut both ways because that also made just every physician who had malpractice uh, insurance uh, a convenient target for a malpractice suit. Um, but they also at the same time lobbied for changes in the legal standard of care itself. Um, and during the 20th century, I don't know, do any of you have me for torts? <laughs> um, uh, during the, 20th, uh, during the um, 19th century, uh, the predominant standard of care to which physicians was, were held was the standard of care of a reasonable physician the same standard of care that everyone is held to under the tort system. Beginning in the mid-19th uh, century, the AMA uh, uh, got treatise writers, uh, academics, and others to, uh, to, uh, 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 to urge a, a change in that standard uh, to, uh, to adopt two changes. One was to hold physicians to the standard of care of physicians where they practiced in the same locality. And the other was to hold physicians not to a reasonable standard of care, but to a customary standard of care, the standard of care that was the custom in the community in which they practiced. And these efforts culminated in a single Vermont Supreme Court case in 1876, Haythorne versus Richmond, where the court uh, essentially adopted simultaneously both rules without really think without speaking very much about it. Um, the uh, the plaintiff's lawyer actually protested at the effect that these rules would have on the ability of patients to bring malpractice actions. The, the court essentially disregarded the, the plaintiff's arguments in the briefs uh, and went ahead and adopted uh, this language um, that. Uh, the language that says that essentially it's the standard of care of physicians in the same locality uh, that is customary uh, in terms of what they're supposed to do. Now, it's important, the locality standard I, I think you're all probably familiar with, um, and that essentially uh, meant that if you were a sole practitioner, you could not be sued for malpractice because there were no experts who were familiar with the standard of care in your community other than yourself, so the plaintiff couldn't find any experts. Uh, even if um, uh, there were other practitioners in the area, um, because in part of the pressure their medical societies put on them, they tended not to want to testify against their colleagues. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, and plaintiffs could not go outside their communities to get experts under this standard. In terms of the customary standard, um, it's interesting to, to understand what that change meant. That is the change from the reasonable standard of care to the, to the, the, stand, to the, to the care that is customary in the community. You might think that that would require plaintiffs, uh, well, experts, um, to uh, introduce evidence of what doctors actually did. In other words, some kind of empirical data surveying doctors, um, you know, uh, uh, observing them, um, and and uh, and introducing uh, uh, you know empirical evidence uh, uh, of these observations. Well, it turns out that's not what happens. In fact, I, there's only one reported case in all of American law in which a court actually um, allowed. Uh, a, uh, the introduction of a practitioner survey, and it, it just simply referred to it. It wasn't a key issue in the case. No other case reported, that is, um, involves uh, one of these, you know, uh, any kind of empirical evidence of custom. Um, what it does do is it, it sort of sets the, it, 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 it um, establishes the language that the experts must use. In other words, the doctor did or did not uh, follow the standard of care that is customary. But in addition, it it eliminated or reduced the ability of judges and juries to second guess what the experts were saying. And this was particularly important where the experts agreed on what the standard of care was. Um, I don't know, how many of you remember the Helling versus Carey case from law school? I think you remember that. That was this, it was a kind of a, a remarkable case because it was one of the few times that a court second guessed the experts in medicine. That was an ophthalmology case where a uh, patient uh, came down with glaucoma. 
um, and she had not been given routine glaucoma tests because she was over, uh, uh, she was under 40, and the standard, the custom at the time was only to give routine glaucoma tests, you know, those little puff tests or the pushing on your eyeball test if you were over 40. And, um, the, uh, and all of the experts, her experts and the defendant's experts agreed that, that, yeah, that was the standard of care, routine testing over 40, only over 40. And yet the court in that case, Supreme Court of Washington, said, no, that standard isn't good enough. Um, it, it remains the court's uh, uh, um, uh, discretion. It's, it's, our, it's in our power to declare that the standard of care in the profession, the custom of the profession, is not adequate. It's not reasonable. Um, which was, of course, the way all other tort actions, and that's the rule in all other tort actions except because of this custom standard in medicine. But that's very, very unusual. That Helen case is actually the only case I know of where the courts actually second-guessed the, the, the medical experts. So that's really the effect of custom, okay? But, but nevertheless, putting these two uh, uh, standards or these two uh, principles together, locality standard and the standard of custom, the medical profession essentially uh, uh, was able to obtain a tremendous amount of control over the standard of care to which its members were being held. Okay? Well, this is pretty much the state of affairs until the middle of the last century, the middle of the 20th century. Um, and, what, and at that point, starting around the mid-1960s, the control the medical profession had over both the internal, you know, sort of consensus on what the standard was, and also on the efforts by external forces to intrude into what the standards in setting the standard, the, the medical profession's power began to slip. It began to slip for a number of reasons. One was the growth of public and private health insurance, and now those who were the third-party payers were now expressing an interest in in in. in uh, uh, affecting the standard of care, for example, to say, you know, you don't really need to do all those diagnostic tests. It's too expensive. It's wasting money. So there were inroads made by the third-party payers, um, um, particularly managed care. Um, uh, and uh, there were also uh, changes. Um, there was uh, the, the um, reaction or the pushback against medical paternalism that's most uh, clearly reflected in the, uh, in the emergence of the informed consent a requirement in the late 1960s. Doctors now had to share the decision-making with their patients. Um, and, uh, and, this, uh, and this led um, uh, also to a disenchantment with mainstream medicine and the, and the uh, sort of reemergence or, or um, uh, growth of, um, of alternative ways of, uh, of providing medical care, what we call complementary and alternative practitioners, um, uh, chiropractic, osteopathy, but also biofeedback, um, acupuncture, the, the kinds of uh, alternative ways of uh, practicing medicine. Those which had been very powerful in the 19th century began to reassert themselves. And uh, uh, by about 1985, uh, patients made more visits to so-called alternative practitioners. There were a greater number of office visits to alternative practitioners than to the so-called mainstream you know, orthodox uh, physicians. Um, Another thing that happened was that the medical profession began to lose its power over the standard of care. Um, the locality rule was abandoned in almost all states, and the uh, judicial deference to the standard of custom began to disappear. Eleven states in the District of Columbia abandoned the custom standard expressly in favor of a reasonableness standard, uh, and nine other states did so, have done so implicitly simply by stating the standard of care is that of a reasonable profession. Another thing happened in the mid-1970s. Um, a fellow named John Wenberg, uh, a health services researcher at Dartmouth, began to investigate the frequency with which patients in different parts of the country receive different uh, medical procedures. And he looked at particularly high-cost medical procedures like um, bypass, uh, sur uh, heart bypass surgery and carotid endarterectomies, which is kind of rotor-rootering your carotid art artery. Um, and what he found was inexplicable, enormous in, inexplicable differences in the frequency with which patients in different parts of the country got these procedures. Patients in Boston were twice as likely to get uh, bypass surgery, half as likely to get carotid endarterectomies, and he attempted to control for any explanation, you know, differences in population, socioeconomic status, um, uh, 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 the severity of patient cases, differences in their, in their conditions, and could not find any rational explanation for this. 
And this, by the way, was one of the major uh, for, uh, factors that led to the uh, growth uh, of the uh, of the managed care movement, because managed care, in the form of the business people who were running these insurance companies, said to themselves, "Well, this shows doctors don't know what the right thing to do is, because it's so different in different parts of the country. Uh, why don't we begin step in and begin to tell doctors what to do in order to rein in healthcare costs?" Well. The, the, um, uh, the, this embarrassed the heck out of the medical profession, these what we call the Wenberg variations, the small area variations, because up until then they had maintained that we are the experts, we know what we're doing, and Wenberg showed that there was no way to rationalize the care that, many, that people were getting in different parts of the country. Um, so the profession began to lose a lot of its power, um, and um, and it, it sort of clawed, has clawed back a bit because the malpractice crises that began in the, in the mid-1970s uh, gave the profession an opportunity to, to strike back um, uh, by um, uh, essentially exaggerating the impact of these crises on physicians and patients and placing the blame squarely on the shoulders of the legal system. Uh, the profession lobbied successfully in states for caps on damages, eliminating joint and several liability, reducing the uh, statute of limitations, offsets for uh, collateral sources, uh, pretrial screening panels, periodic payments, limits on attorneys, uh, contingent fees, uh, and so on. And in addition, the, the profession mounted a campaign to regain control over the standard of care. Um, uh, one of the things it did was to go after experts, uh, plaintiff's experts, that is, as I mentioned earlier. But another thing that it did was to set aside its historic opposition to the idea of cookbook medicine, um, uh, and in the early 1990s to support the use of medical practice guidelines uh, as safe harbors against malpractice liability. So what's a medical practice guideline? This is the standard definition from the Institute of Medicine. The Institute of Medicine is kind of the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, it's the, uh, it's the, it's the uh, institution that represents primarily academic medicine, but it is probably the most respected medical entity uh, in, in, in the country. Uh, and this, their definition is a practice guideline is systematically developed statements to assist practitioner and patient decisions about appropriate health care for specific clinical circumstances. So the idea was that you would get experts together uh, and they would agree on what the appropriate thing to do in a particular circumstance was and they would, they would write this down and they would spread this around um, and this is what uh, doctors were supposed to do. Um, and practice guidelines were kind of became the holy grail um, it was the panacea for everything that was wrong with medicine, every problem that the medical system had. Um, Arnold Rossoff, who is a, a law professor uh, who teaches at the Wharton School, said their great promise, uh, he said this in 1990, uh, 2001 actually, their great promise is to improve the quality of care, help contain health care costs, reduce disputes about coverage under health plans, uh, and ease the financial and other burdens of medical malpractice litigation on the health care system. That's a lot of things to accomplish with one, with one, you know, with one idea. In 1990, David Eddy, who was one, uh, uh, one of the leading health services researchers, predicted that practice guidelines have the potential to affect the quality and cost of medical care more profoundly than all the new treatments of the past or next decade. Wow, this was a lot of this was a lot of promise promises being made for practice guidelines. Um, they were also viewed as a way of reducing physicians' malpractice risks. So in 1982, uh, ABC, aired, uh, ABC News aired a 2020 program that exposed the dangers that patients faced when they underwent general anesthesia. And this was a you know, kind of a shocker program, and it, uh, and it led the American Society of Anesthesiologists uh, with the Harvard Medical School to promulgate a set of practice guidelines for how physicians should, should deliver, how anesthesiologists should deliver and general anesthesia, and included things like check the patient's vitals every five minutes, which seems to be kind of a no-brainer, but was apparently not being routinely done. Um, and this ended up uh, actually dramatically reducing uh, the, the proliferation of this one set of anesthesia standards ended up dramatically reducing the number of patient deaths and injuries under anesthesia also dramatically reduced the malpractice insurance premiums for anesthesiologists. So this was heralded as you know, an example of how malpractice uh, uh, practice guidelines could actually take the malpractice monkey off of the medical profession's back. 
Well, in 1990, the legislature in Maine did something interesting. They adopted a scheme that was based on practice guidelines, but they skipped the crucial step of having the guidelines actually improve the quality of care. What the Maine legislature did was to adopt a five-year project that authorized medical specialty societies in Maine. Initially, there were three, radiology, um, of, uh, orthopedics and obstetric uh, uh, and gynecology to, um, to issue practice guidelines. And furthermore, the legislation made the practice guidelines once issued at the administrative rules of the state. If you remember administrative law, that means that their substance could, ne could not thereafter be challenged. So patients could not say, this, is, this practice guideline is not correct, it's not valid. That was no longer possible once the notice and comment rulemaking pro process had been completed. And the third thing they tried to do, actually, was to have only guidelines only be able to be used defensively. That is, physicians could assert that they had adhered to a guideline, and that would be an absolute defense to malpractice, but patients would not be allowed to introduce the fact that a physician had failed to follow a guideline as evidence of negligence. So it was a one-way street. The argument for that was that they needed to make it a one-way street so physicians would feel comfortable giving up some of their clinical autonomy, their discretion, to follow practice guidelines. That was the rationale for the one-way street idea. Um, and a number of other states, Vermont, Minnesota, and Florida, uh, ad uh, adopted similar programs. Um, and uh, Republicans, in, in particular in Congress, pushed for federal legislation to make this uh, 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 what, was, what became, eventually became known as a safe harbors approach a, a, uh, uh, you know, nationwide. And President Clinton endorsed the idea in his 1992 campaign, and it was included as a pilot program in the Health Security Act, in his health reform legislation. Now, health reform in the 1990s, as we know, went nowhere. This is a cartoon from that time. We might see it reemerge, depending on what the Supreme Court does uh, soon. Um, um, so the health reform didn't go anywhere, and neither did any of these uh, safe harbors programs. There were a number of reasons why they didn't go anywhere. Um, in Maine, um, they ran into uh, a slight problem, and that is that the Maine legislature previously had adopted a so-called malpractice reform that, requires, uh, that required plaintiffs to first have their claim screened by a pretrial screening panel. Um, and, only, uh, and then the, the result of the pretrial screening panel's review was admissible in uh, the subsequent malpractice case in the, in the, in the trial. Uh, the problem that this created was that if the, if the pretrial screening panel rejected the doctor's defense, that could be introduced by the plaintiff as evidence in the trial, in the malpractice action, which essentially allowed plaintiffs to use the failure to follow guidelines as, a, as an offensive tactic. It, in other words, it, did not, it, it made them now two-way streets. And that so frightened doctors that only once in the five years this program was in effect did a doctor assert adherence to a guideline as a defense in a malpractice suit in Maine. Um, uh, the other states never adopted guidelines. Um, they either let their programs languish or they repealed them. Nothing happened in Congress. Um, and so there were a number of reasons for this, including that sort of pretrial screening quirk in Maine. But the main reason that nothing happened was that the guidelines themselves had problems. Um, there, were, there were thousands of them, there were more than a thousand of them, many of which had conflicting recommendations. Okay, which ones were the appropriate ones for doctors to use as defenses? Any of them? Um, just some? Um, even if there was only one guideline on a particular issue, on a particular topic, the guidelines contained escape clauses and loopholes. They said, in effect, this is what you should do in this particular case unless you shouldn't do this. Even the anesthesia guidelines that had been so effective had this kind of an escape clause. It said, take patient vitals every five minutes unless that's clinically uh, inappropriate. Well, how can that be a standard of care? Because, the, you know, if a physician deviated from the standard, that could simply be because it wasn't appropriate. Um, if they adhered to the standard, they might have done so in an inappropriate situation. Um, but the main reason that the guidelines failed was that they uh, essentially had no scientific background. They had no scientific basis. 
They were often typically uh, uh, the musings of a group of practitioners, typically what we always did or what I was taught in medical school. Um, and that was the same kind of approach that led to those variations that John Wenberg and his colleagues at Dartmouth had found. Even if a guideline had been based on good scientific evidence, by the, had been issued by an unbiased group of professionals, because another problem was that the groups that were issuing these guidelines typically were self-interested, right? Um, a classic example in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s, early 1990s, the American College of Rheumatology, that's the specialists who handle rheumato rheumatology problems, came out with a guideline that said that if you have um, um, uh, arthritis, you, sh you, you must be treated by a board-certified rheumatologist, in other words, one of our guys. What, meaning you couldn't go to a regular GP and get treatment. It would be inappropriate for a GP to treat someone for arthritis. Why did they do this? Because they wanted all the business, right? The rheumatologists wanted all the business. Well, the American College of Physicians, representing the general practitioners, came back with their own guideline and said, no, it's perfectly appropriate for general practitioners, our members, in other words, to treat patients um, with, ba you know, with you know, basic arthritis. Um, why would, you know, were you, which one of those recommendations was appropriate? Well, the problem was they were both very, coming from very biased sources. Even if a guideline was produced by an unbiased source, by, for example, met, uh, people on the panels who did not have, say, um, uh, the conflicts of interest with, say, the drug companies that made the drugs to treat conditions that they were recommending, um, even if there was sound scientific support, guidelines were often stale. Right? How frequently were they being updated? So it might have, they might have been accurate and valid at one point, but by the time somebody's trying to use them as a defense in a malpractice suit, they were out of date. And yet the issuing group had not gotten around to updating them. So the Institute of Medicine, this very prestigious group of uh, uh, academic physicians, said in 1990, today the field of guidelines development is a confusing mix of high expectations, competing organizations, conflicting philosophies, and ill-defined or incompatible objectives. It suffers from imperfect and incomplete scientific knowledge, as well as imperfect and uneven means of applying that knowledge, applying that knowledge. Despite the good intentions of many involved parties, the enterprise lacks clearly articulated goals, coherent structures, and credible mechanisms for evaluating, improving, and coordinating guidelines development to meet social needs for good quality, affordable health care. So that was essentially the death knell. Even the AMA back, uh, did not wholeheartedly support this early 1990s guidelines initiative uh, to make them safe harbors in malpractice suits. So we now have this revive, this reemergence of this interest in malpractice uh, in safe harbors. So the question is, are the currently available practice guidelines better, sufficiently better, that they can legitimately serve this function of delineating the standard of care in a way that is conclusive? So it, it, there's no longer going to be a battle of the experts over what the doctor should have done. The standard will be set based on the guideline. Well, the supporters of the current effort uh, put their faith in something called evidence-based guidelines. And this is now the new panacea for controlling health care costs, so, uh, improving health care quality, and solving the malpractice problem. Um, and uh, how many of you have heard of the idea of evidence-based guidelines? How many of you heard of evidence-based medicine? Well, this was a big initiative. Um, under, uh, by the Obama administration, the, um, uh, the stimulus bill in, 19, uh, in 2009 allocated 1.1 billion federal dollars to supporting the uh, uh, performance of studies to create the evidence base for medical practice. So the idea was let's, since you know, we can't agree on what is the appropriate thing to do in a particular case, why don't we go out and figure out what that is? Let's do studies that now compare different ways of approaching a patient's condition to see which one is best. And this is what is called comparative effectiveness research. And this was a big push by the uh, Obama administration in their health reform, in its health reform uh, initiative. This was also, by the way, what led to the attacks by the Republicans saying that what you're going to create is death panels. Because what they were concerned with 
about was that these, uh, this comparative effectiveness research, which led to these so-called evidence-based practice guidelines, would be rationing tools, would be used by the government to ration health care that was valuable, but perhaps not so, uh, so uh, enough bang for the buck. Um, and so evidence-based guidelines, the new sort of holy grail, are supposed to be based, based on impartial, rigorous analysis of evidence from well-designed studies and from deep clinical and scientific expertise. And the scientific evidence is supposed to come from these new, this new sort of flood of comparative effectiveness research. The problem is that, like the early 1990s, the, this, this um, uh, reliance on practice guidelines, this, the idea of evidence-based guidelines as solving all these problems is once again misplaced. Um, there's no agreement, for example, on what evidence is needed to support a guideline. The experts disagree. Is, is, is an agreement by, uh, by a, a group of experts enough? Do you need a clinical trial? Do you need just one clinical trial? How does it have to be designed? How, how long ago can it have that taken place to still be valid? There's no agreement on those fundamental aspects of the enterprise. And in addition, it's not clear that the evidence that they're expecting can actually be produced. Now, I don't have time to go into this at length, but the idea is to, is to look at populations of patients in clinical trials um, you give one large group of people one drug, another large group of people another drug, you see which seems to do better, and that becomes the standard of care. When patients have condition A, give them drug X. Well, if you stop to think about it, one of the things we're learning more and more, particularly through um, our, our growing knowledge of, of the genetics of healthcare, is that people are different. The disease that one person has called arthritis is very different from the arthritis disease that another person has. And furthermore, people react very idiosyncratically to different drugs and other treatments. And so this idea of taking broad population-based findings and saying they're appropriate for a specific case, a specific patient, um, it, uh, is, is, is essentially unsound. Um, and. Um, uh, and then, of course, if it was ever sound at one point, it's likely to no longer be, that is, the data is no longer likely to be valid today, years later when it's being asserted in a malpractice case. So this is, this is the sort of um, uh, policy basis behind this push for evidence-based guidelines and the idea that let's let doctors uh, assert their adherence to one of these guidelines as a conclusive absolute defense to malpractice. Well. Let's assume for, the, for a moment, though, that there actually was such a guideline, that there was a trustworthy, scientifically valid guideline that actually told physicians what to do in a specific case without the loophole that said, unless it isn't the right thing to do. Let's suppose there, was, there is such a guideline. Let's suppose that this comparative effectiveness initiative um, uh, yields uh, you know, a, a, these, a, an effective guideline like this. Um, and physicians who complied with such a guideline, I think we would all agree, um, uh, would be entitled to use them persuasively in their defense, right? I mean, if there was truly a, a, a valid, a scientifically valid guideline produced by unbiased sources that said this is the right thing to do, physicians ought to be able to rely on that, right? The problem is how would a court know one when it saw it, right? All that the physician appears to have to do is to say, look, there's this guideline produced by this group. I followed it. You can't sue me, right? How, uh, the idea is to take judges and juries completely out of the picture. Uh, so the idea seems to be that any guideline, no matter who issues it, would be sufficient, you know, would be, uh, 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 would be appropriate for doctors to use as these defenses. Um, who's going to create these guidelines? Well. One of the things that the medical profession is, is insisting on is that it is the source of the guidelines, as opposed to third-party payers like health insurers, as opposed to the government, right? They're opposed to rationing. They're opposed to having non-medical experts tell them what the right thing to do is. But there is no single authoritative medical source that can issue guidelines. Right? The IOM isn't in that business. It doesn't have the, the wherewithal to do that. The AMA is just one of medical association. There are a number of other medical associations. There are rival medical specialty groups. So without a single authoritative source, and I can't imagine how such a source could actually ever be created, um, given what the task would be, but, 
But without that, it would, it would seem that any guideline issued by any medical group would have to do, perhaps including a guideline issued by the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, whose executive director states that, quote, comparative effectiveness research won't buy anything for you. It will just pay bureaucrats and researchers, and whose newsletter describes evidence-based practice as, quote, a greater merger of state and corporate power than Mussolini's fascism. Now, what's to prevent them from issuing some guideline that, that um, practitioners can, can essentially hide behind? Now, from the perspective of the historical battles that medicine has waged against outside forces and also internal dissension about the standard of care, the idea that any medical group's guidelines should be able to serve as the standard of care is actually an intriguing gamble. They're, they're, they're gambling on something, okay? Um, in terms of the law, you know, so long as it corresponded to a guideline, no medical approach would be deemed incorrect and none could be said to be better than another. By allowing virtually any guideline to define the standard of care in this fashion, the mainstream profession effectively renounces its ability to control the standard of care internally, right? Any fringe group can now issue a guideline. The, the alternative and complementary practitioners, the, you know, the, 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 the people who go out and, and, and open these, these strange cancer treatment centers in the Bahamas, because it would be illegal to do that in this country, could issue a standard saying ours is the appropriate standard for cancer treatment. Right? At that point, the medical profession has lost what it so, so, uh, uh, so um, um, dearly uh, uh, attempted to win, and that was control by the mainstream scientific medical practitioners over their rivals. What does it get in return? Well, in return, it, uh, the physician community as a whole, including these alternative approach uh, people, would take external control of the standard away from the judicial system. That's the quid pro quo that they would get. Well, one question is what would happen to the quality of patient care under this? Um, a laissez-faire, safe harbors program in which essentially any medical group could uh, issue definitive guidelines could instigate a race to the bottom in which fringe groups like the uh, American Association of Physicians and Surgeons um, could, uh, uh, could um, uh, immunize their members from suit by issuing unorthodox or minimalist recommendations. Another concern is that uh, the resulting deterioration in the quality of care could end up doing exactly what the profession fears most, and that is leading the government and other external uh, uh, forces to uh, take control of the standard of care away from the profession. But in the meantime, what would justify giving the medical profession this much power? What would justify giving them this power over their standard of care, taking it away from the judicial system? Well. If you look at the sociology of the professions, and this is one of the leading uh, uh, reports by a sociologist named Ed, uh, Elliot Friedson, the, the uh, idea that professions should be able to regulate themselves is based on two assumptions. One is that only the professionals have the knowledge and experience to enable them to evaluate the appropriateness of what they do, in this case of their care. And also that because they're professionals, they can be trusted to place the public good, in this case, the interests of their patients, above their own self-interest. That's the two conditions that justify professional self-regulation. The problem is that neither of those conditions holds true for American medicine, right? As John Wenberg's studies showed, the physicians have far less expertise than they claim. Um, and the, unfortunately, the profession has shown itself incapable of placing the public interest above its own. Timothy Jost, a law professor at William & Mary, decries the fact that, the medical, that medical practitioners increasingly view themselves as businessmen engaged in commerce rather than as professionals and gentlemen. And the, this reality that the medical profession is really self rather than other regarding it was powerfully reinforced by uh, the uh, article in 2009 in the New Yorker by uh, this uh, surgeon named Atul Gawanda, who's actually, by the way, from Ohio. Um, he investigated why patients, uh, why the care for patients in a town in, in Texas, McAllen, Texas, cost Medicare twice as much as the national average for the same care. Okay, and he concluded that this was due to the fact that, quote, a medical community came to treat patients the way some prime mortgage lenders treated home buyers as profit centers. 
Well, the realization that medicine is le both less expert and more self-interested than it would like to believe is a major reason why the profession has lost a substantial degree of control over the standard of care, why judges are increasingly abandoning the, uh, uh, the custom standard, and why virtually all jurisdictions have abandoned the locality standard. And if the profession is unable to hold on to the powers it once exercised over the standard of care because it can no longer satisfy the conditions that legitimize it, that legitimize the substantial exercise of self-regulation, self then it certainly doesn't seem entitled to the enormous increase in self-regulatory powers that would result if judges were no longer permitted to assess the validity of practice guidelines as evidence of the standard of care. One final thought. No other profession has this power. In our professional rules, there is a disclaimer in the introduction that says, by the way, these rules may not be used to establish the standard of care for lawyers. Now, it's an interesting question, why do we have that sort of uh, 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 disclaimer in our own rules? It's probably for antitrust reasons, uh, going back to Goldfarb and so on. But in fact, no other profession has this much power. And the question is, what would justify giving it to physicians? Thank you very much. <laughs> now you can see why I asked if there were any physicians in the audience. <laughs> Questions, yes, comments. Oh, sorry. Yeah, hi. I enjoyed your talk. And about uh, 40 minutes ago, you mentioned about how the AMA was going after plaintiffs' experts. Now, I really am curious what you meant because you didn't um, expand, expo expand upon that. Yeah, well, it's not just the AMA. It's local and state medical societies, and it's also occasionally defendants, in other words, physicians, um, who feel that they've been unfairly treated by the other side's experts in a, in a, in a case and go after the expert for uh, various, you know, various misdeeds. But the medical profession is, uh, for example, asserted, there's a big, dis there's a dispute over whether um, expert, acting as an expert is the practice of medicine or not. If it's not the practice of medicine, then the state medical boards and the medical groups have no uh, uh, power over their members when they do that any more than they'd have power over their members when they play golf. But if it is the practice of medicine, then local and state and federal <coughs> and national medical groups are saying, you're practicing medicine when you testify and you have to follow our standards for how to do this, and basically you have to, do, you have to testify based on you know, um, appropriate um, basis, so it gets into the Daubert and Fry issues, but only from the defendant's viewpoint. And so they have actually excommunicated members who have testified for plaintiff's experts. They have uh, uh, thrown them out of membership of their organizations, and this can have practi serious practical repercussions in terms of affecting their licensure and also their ability to have admitting privileges at hospitals. So that's one of the main things that groups have done. And there was a lawsuit brought by a plaintiff's expert um, in the Seventh Circuit against this practice. And one of the arguments the, plaintiffs, uh, ma the plaintiff made was, you know, the only time they go after experts is when they're plaintiff's experts. They don't go after defendant's experts. Doesn't that show that this is, you know, not, this is not a, uh, uh, you know, this is not a, um, this should not be allowed. And uh, it, Richard Posner, whom you may know of, um, uh, was the judge who decided that, and, and his answer was, well, of course they're going to go after uh, the, only the plaintiff's experts. Look who they're representing. They're, you know, they're in business for their members, and that's perfectly legitimate. So that's what happened. If I got you right, part of the impetus for uh, evidence-based guidelines is the um, um, to gain support for Obama's health care plan. Is that correct? The, uh, that's yeah. That is what is um, behind the Obama administration of the um, support for practice guidelines of safe okay. harbors. And my, my question then is, what is the status of establishing these guidelines? Where are we on that effort? Well, that's, that's what I was, I was sort of predicting what would happen. Um, the uh, AHRQ is giving out money to, uh, uh, to conduct these comparative effectiveness studies. The big question is, can we do this kind of research without actually doing clinical trials? In other words, can we go back and mine the patient records and somehow tease out from the from medical re existing medical records what the appropriate thing to do was in a particular patient's case. This then ties in with the push for electronic medical records. So the idea is if we all have electronic medical records, all our records are you know on a computer, and they are standardized. That is you know every record is is 
put inputted according to the same rules, then conceivably these these data miners, these researchers can go in and maybe figure out, well, this look, why did this patient die and this patient go home? The patient who died got twice as much of the drug than the other patient, and so on. This is a lot of assumptions, though. Um, a lot time. That's right. Um, uh, and by the time you finish this, it, isn't it out of date already? So how often do you have to redo these these studies? Um, don't, the problem, of course, is don't ask me what the solution is. Well, the solution, in, as far as safe harbors is concerned, by the way, we um, researched, my research assistant and I, looked at every reported case in which practice guidelines were used as evidence by either party. And they're about, um, it, it, since 19, uh, gosh, 1970. Um, and there are about 50 cases that are reported. And these cases, the guidelines are used differently. They're used by plaintiffs. They're used by defendants. In some cases, they are some evidence of negligence or uh, non-negligence. In other cases, they have more of a presumptive effect. In no case does a court uh, a, a say that the guidelines are being used inappropriately, and medical experts who've looked at these cases say, no, this, these are legitimate, you know, appropriate uses of practice guidelines. Um, if the practice guideline is sound and states, you know, a, a valid uh, a, a recommendation, doctors should be able to rely on them. But you have to allow plaintiffs' lawyers to be able to question that. You have to allow judges to decide whether the guideline is admissible, and if so, how much weight to give it. Yes. Uh, I don't know who was first. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, is cost considered a part of these guidelines? For instance, if uh, the, you know, uh, uh, something, a uh, test is proven, uh, the efficacy is determined clinically, yet it is prohibitively expensive, what do you do? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the original versions of the stimulus bill, which, ought, which set aside these, this, this $1.1 billion for the underlying scientific research, said that this research could then be used to design uh, uh, standards that would take cost into account. And Medicare should use that to decide what to pay for and what not to pay for. And that was what stimulated the attack on the basis this was death panels. And so that was all, that was, all of that was stripped out of the stimulus bill. And it's also prohibited under, the, uh, under PAPACA, under the uh, health reform legislation that did pass. And so you can't, basically, you can't use cost effectiveness as a measure of what is the appropriate thing to do which is really interesting. Yeah. Um, Secondly, uh, given our the legal profession, the debates about constitutional interpretation, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, are the guidelines going to be viewed as uh, quote-unquote living documents that can change as new technology is developed and uh, new, new uh, standards are established? Well, they have to, right? They have to be able to change, right? And so you have this sort of floating standard. But, but what, one thing that's interesting, I didn't talk about it, is the constitutionality of a one-way street approach. Um, you might think that's unconstitutional. I mean, how can you deprive plaintiffs from using evidence that defendants can use? I mean, isn't that a violation of the right to jury trial and so on? Turns out, although we, we, we actually do that about four places in the rules of evidence, we actually do allow um, uh, one party to use evidence and, and another party not to. For example, in sexual assault cases, you can, uh, there's, there are differences like that in what the prosecution and the defense can introduce uh, for good reasons. But um, there are always very good reasons for doing that which don't, which don't apply here. Um, turns out you can't really make a strong constitutional argument against the one-way street, which is interesting. So I don't, I don't say much about that. It's not really a good way to go. Yeah. Well, uh, particularly if the future does hold that these uh, guidelines would become the safe harbor, uh, would not, would you not think that the next step for the plaintiff's malpractice bar would be to sue the proponent of the guideline for developing deficient guidelines? Uh, this is an interesting idea. Um, there's a law professor named uh, Ronan Avraham, who is uh, at the University of Texas, who has suggested that, that the way to get around who's issuing these guidelines and how can we trust them to be doing it in the public interest and what's this, is to have for-profit entities issue guidelines and to have it basically be like a free market for guidelines, but the saving, the saving uh, pro uh, provision is that uh, plaintiffs who are injured by doctors who follow a guideline 
when they shouldn't have, should be able to sue the, the for-profit guideline issuer. It's an interesting idea. You know, it's what kind of thing policy wonk will come up with in the middle of the night. Um, highly impractical, impractical, for example, who's going to pay for these, who's going to, you know, who's going to pay for these guidelines to be produced by these for-profit enterprises. Um, there are problems, I mean, so if, do you know about the, there's, you know, so, um, you, uh, underwriters laboratories, consumers union um, occasionally have been sued for, you know, coming out with, in a, you know, what are regarded as inappropriate um, recommendations. And largely, my understanding is those suits are largely um, um, not, not successful for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'm a little bit interested in how you would respond to this because uh, it's a safe harbor. The concept of following the guideline is a safe harbor. Well, the, the doctor could follow the guideline, but he could do it poorly. Right. So the, 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 the courts would presumably still have to decide whether the doctor, in fact, followed the guideline. Right? And, and that includes you know, performing whatever the guideline recommends in an appropriate fashion. So that would still remain. But the, you know, the, the, the so-called battle of the experts in which you know, the dispute is over, well, what was the appropriate thing to do? Or what was the appropriate way to do it? So one question you're raising, which is very important, is how detailed are the guidelines? Yeah, do bypass surgery, fine. Can I do it when I'm drunk? You know, I mean, how specific is it going to be? Um, you know, what, what suture size should you use and so on? Um, so, yeah, that, the less specific, the less definitive they, they should be. But the problem is that these, this sort of policy approach might make them definitive so that if, you know, as long as you follow the general guideline, you're immune, no matter how you did it. That's a good point. Well, it's 9.30, so you can um, um, I'll go off to your real world, and I'll go off to my ivory tower. But thank you very much. Um, hope to see you in another one of these.